invitation for me to be here. Uh, last time I didn't really see you, I was on Zoom a few years back, and so that was really fun, but it's much, much more fun to be with you in person and have a chance to interact and see faces and respond to all the uh, all the energy that's in the room. So uh, um, I have to, one small confession. We had a big annual event yesterday for our organization. It was a tall ship sail on San Francisco Bay. It was glorious. It was fun. It was a long night. <laughs> um, so I'm here this morning. I didn't think I'd be quite so tired as I am, but, but I... Um, Happy to be with you and then keep the energy going. So our organization is a little bit over 25 years old. It was founded um, back in the late 90s because at the time, our understanding of ocean conservation and marine biodiversity was not um, being translated into the policies and the government uh, kind of programs in the way that we thought as scientists it should be. And so after kind of spending some time thinking about ways we could do that. Um, and and I, I started in 2000, but I had actually been working with Elliot Norris, our founder for several years in front of that. We decided let's just, you know, start our own institute and, and get going. Um, and as a result, you know, we didn't know how well we would do at the time, but, but here we are over 25 years later, still working. Um, I changed the title a little bit because I do feel like I'm on a bit of a quest these days. Um, not only to educate people, but also try and get governments and nations and people, communities to respond to the, the threats to our ocean. So I do uh, well recognize some of this is pretty deep and heavy. Hopefully I will give you a little bit of hope um, over the course of the conversation and leave you with some uh, optimism for the future, even though we all uh, you know, can feel the weight of so much that's going on. Let's see. Uh oh. Let's see if the keyboard works. Well, it's not going to be as much fun if I can't get it to move, <laughs> move forward. All right. Fine. Okay. I keep mouse is working, so I think we'll be okay. All right, thank you, Judy. Okay, so I think we all are familiar with the idea that this is really a blue planet, not a terrestrial planet, and some interesting things about that. Um, we know life evolved in the ocean, but even today, 95% of the livable space on the planet, planet is in the ocean. Um, it's kind of hard to fathom, right? The average depth of the ocean is over four kilometers deep, so the volume of the ocean is tremendous. What happens in the ocean is driving our climate. It's making the world habitable for us. It's the oxygen um, that we need to breathe is generated mostly in the ocean. Now, obviously, the forests are very important to that as well. So it, it's really hard, and it's always a challenge to kind of explain what's going on in the ocean because so few people are probably going to get any deeper than six feet in their life. Um, and the ocean's not the most welcoming of places, right? A lot of us are, you know, a little terrified by the big things that swim in the ocean. Um, so it's an, an interesting uh, situation. And, and I put this up because here's what the planet would look like without the ocean on top. If you just strip off all the water, it's not a very attractive thing. It's kind of disfigured in some interesting ways. Um, but it is kind of the thing I think about a lot in terms of running the organization and ocean conservation is, you know, what would, what would the world look like without water? So here is literally uh, what it would look like. Um, but we get a lot of benefits from the ocean. Um, and so when I think in, and sometimes talk a lot about biodiversity, because as a scientist, that's what I've been very interested in. 
I'm always reminded of the fact that we get so much more than just you know the marine life and all the intricacies and all the ecological link linkages that do exist. Um, but you know, it's a source of food. It's a source of recreation. The coastal, you know, seagrasses, mangroves, kelp forests all mitigate kind of the coastline for us and keep you know the systems intact. So there's a, a lot of these larger values that we take for granted. The ocean is not charging us anything for all of these things, um, but we are definitely taking advantage of them and it's very important to our economies and lifestyles. I was very fortunate that in growing up here in Coronado, which is, this is the Victorian Hotel Del Coronado, of kind of recognizing early on the importance of just what a healthy beach environment means to a small community. I mean, this is, the whole source of kind of why that community exists. Um, and it's not just beautiful, it's not just a place to retreat and relax, but it, you know, there's a lot of marine life even on a sandy beach. And so as a kid, that was kind of where I first, you know, became aware of things like sand crabs and seabirds and, you know, stingrays, because if you don't shuffle your feet, you get hit by them. Um, there's a lot there that's in, in the coastal environment. And of course, I got engaged in kelp forests and diving and, and really got to spend quite a bit of time in the water as a, as a young teenager and on into my you know, 20s and 30s as a scientist. And I always was intrigued by the diversity of life and, and what was going on and all the different strange creatures here. And there's things up here that are called Dumbo octopuses and um, which is that little guy and vampire squids and you know sperm whales and deep sea corals and, and of course sea otters which we all love i'll talk about a little bit more so both just out of pure interest but also just kind of pure fascination i got involved in this field and was lucky enough as a scientist you know to kind of keep going and keep having opportunities to explore and those took me not just as a scuba diver around the world as a submersible pilot um, this is the uh, undersea habitat that's off the Florida Keys in which you can live in that for up to a couple of weeks at a time and then dive on the deep reef and have an experience to, you know, explore, learn things about it, do longer term studies, which, you know, enable you to be at the bottom of the ocean for a much longer period of time than you might be scuba diving, which is sometimes about an hour at a time. So all was not well in that cute little Victorian Hotel Dell um, Coronado. It, it had a you know a pretty um, what we didn't really think of at the time. We thought of it as an afternoon sport, right? So this is in front of the Hotel Dell. These are giant black sea bass. The average weight's you know something well over two hundred pounds. They were all but extinct by the sixties. Um, so. 60s is a reference point for me because that's when I started going into the ocean and I had no idea of these fish because they weren't there. They weren't completely extinct, but they were completely gone and they were gone primarily because of a recreational fishing catch, not because of a commercial catch. There was a little bit, but it, but it was really this idea. And because they lived so long and their numbers weren't that great, it wasn't that hard to fish them out of coastal California. And this is true of a variety of other things, including you know, things we might think of in terms of abalone. Um, but being from California, you're no doubt aware of uh, sea otters and sea otters are basically taken out of our ecosystem here in coastal California in about a 25 year period. So about 1800, you know, the Russians come down, they bring some slaves from you know, the Aleutians with them who teach them, or were very good at killing otters, and they, they were enslaved by the, the Russians at Fort Ross. But it was only 25 years, the 1830s, and otters were basically gone. The last otters we know about in the Bay Area were actually right here in Sonoma. They were living at the mouth of Sonoma River, and it's said that um, General Vallejo actually had an interest in the otters, which, which was kind of keeping people from taking them at the time. He went on a trip somewhere and the last 10 otters disappeared out of San Francisco Bay, um, not to return yet. Um, every once in a while, you might see some good news. There's a lone otter, one otter, he'll show up at Richardson Bay in Sausalito and fool around in the bay a little bit, but we haven't seen otters return to this um, part of the state uh, since that time, a couple of. And that's important because otters are really important um, parts of ecosystems, and, in, and not just otters, but these are stellar sea cows. These were up in, in Bering Sea. They were exterminated in the 1740s. Again, think about a large sea cow living in kelp forests and what that might've been doing in those systems that it's gone now. I mean, we, we don't 
1740s, we were just probably smart enough to recognize this as an unusual animal, um, and but then it went extinct. So we don't really know the ecological role it was playing um, in these systems. We know a little bit more about uh, the otter, and I'll come back to that. If you look at the timeline across the bottom here, you can see that you know what has been a you know couple hundred year process of intensifying industrialization to today's kind of look at what's going on. We've continued to just build up demand and fishing fleets. And this is an opening day fishing fleet um, from a small port in China. And you can just see all those fishing vessels heading out at that time. And you play that out across not just China, but across all of Asia and all of you know the rest of the world. You can see that our demand, just in terms of the number of boats going out, is something phenomenal. And we're putting a lot of pressure on the ocean. So historically, we know the biggest impact we had on the ocean was just by taking out marine life, whether it was inadvertently, you know, like we were just catching, you know, big fish on hook and line and we didn't know they were coming to an end, or whether it's more deliberate like it is today, we are altering the ocean and as a result, altering the function of the ocean by taking out all this marine life. Um, Sometimes we catch things we don't want to catch and we discard them over the side of the boat. So it's estimated about 25% globally of the catch is just discarded immediately. It's not even kept. Um, we have very destructive forms of fishing as well. This is a form of fishing called bottom trawling. Sometimes dredging or dragging is included, but you take these big, huge nets, dragging them across the seafloor. They are good at catching what um, are sometimes fishes that we're targeting, but they're also very good at catching other things we're not targeting as well as all the marine life. Think of corals and sponges, and the, these are the little nursery areas for small fish. They're the areas that are also protecting them from getting eaten by bigger fish. And we're just kind of scooping all of this up. And in scooping it all up, you can see this is a, um, a rather large, it's called a, a bubblegum tree coral but it's something on the order of several meters, meters tall. And we know that some deep sea corals are gonna live well over a thousand years. The oldest one we know about is a 4,000 year old coral that's um, from Hawaii, one of the seamounts off that. So it's not just that we're taking this out, we're all training an ecosystem that may be at least hundreds, probably thousands of years old. So recovery is hundreds to thousands of years, should we even start, right? And we're not even really starting in this context. Okay, so that's kind of, you know, history still continuing today. We all know climate change is now an impact. Um, this cover, I think, is from 2008 <laughs> for Time Magazine. So we've not, we've had 15 at least years of saying we should be really worried about this, and I don't think we're still doing near enough to address it. Um, off our coast, we had this warm blob, so this coast of North America, and that dark red is the area in which the water dramatically warmed up a few years ago, so we saw all these kelp forest die-offs. Luckily, it didn't prolong more than a couple of years, so the kelp forests are starting to come back this year, but then you probably heard about the sea urchin outbreak and the loss of the sea stars that would eat the sea urchins through a disease outbreak, also probably to related to the warming. And so we're still kind of recovering with, you know, our favorite El Nino guys coming, uh, El Nino guy coming by later this year. So um, for me, who kind of delves a little bit between the academic literature, academic science, and kind of facing out to the public, you know, I read a lot of these kinds of, you know, science books like The Sixth Extinction and Elizabeth Colbert, or Colbert is, is a, wonderful author if you're interested in these issues it's not always the happiest reads but but really we're you know at this point in which we're kind of becoming aware of this idea not not just because we're killing too much but there's just too many changes accumulating um, in the ocean and we're not done right the next thing up is deep seabed mining this is one version of what a mining instrument would look like on the ocean um, there are many others. It's a very active debate right now. The UN International Seabed Authority is the agency charged with overseeing this. The Deep Sea Conservation Coalition, of which I'm, I'm chairman and part of, is actually going there this week um, to another round of negotiations, trying to get a moratorium, trying to get a stop to this. Um, 
we have a lot of growing interest in some countries, but the authority is really to go mine, not to stop mining. So it's a very, very active, um, engaged um, debate right now. All right, so this looks to be a relatively significant crisis. It's a biodiversity crisis, it's a climate crisis, it's also a nature crisis. And I mean by that the fact that a lot of people just aren't aware of everything that's going on. We kind of lost touch a little bit with nature and we really need to kind of engender a, a kind of a global movement of people as well as addressing it through the, um, the science and the big international meetings like the UN um, Climate Conference. So a form reliever, we need a bold plan. We got to talk about not just protecting things, but recovering things. And this is part of the work that we do at Marine Conservation Institute. This is our mission dedicated to securing permanent strong protection for the ocean's most important places. We think that if we protect the key habitats, that's kind of the cornerstone of having the pieces there to rebuild and recover marine life. There's a lot of global context for where we um, fit in. So I do attend some of these big international conferences. Um, we do try to put our work into the international context. So the MPA guide is a project we've been working on for a long time. MPA is short for Marine Protected Area. Think about a national park kind of idea, just underwater. Um, but we wanna make sure that people, when they do this, are actually getting the biodiversity and the human uh, benefits from a protected area. And so this is why we have this project called the MPA Guy. We're trying to inform that. Um, you might've heard about the Global Biodiversity Framework. This is a big convention under the uh, Convention for Biological Diversity. It just announced this idea of 30 by 30. Um, and this is protect at least 30%, both the land and the ocean by 2030. And so a lot of what you're gonna hear in the rest of this talk is efforts to get there. Um, and then I've also been in, involved um, with the UN as well on the biodiversity treaty. So the High Seas Alliance of which I'm a part of has been um, with, you know, I'm not a legal scholar, but with legal scholars trying to build this convention. So it did finally get agreed to earlier this year, which was um, end of about a 20 year effort. Um, it started to become open for signing and ratification a month ago, and so far we've got 80 countries who are signed on. Ratification takes a little bit longer, but we need 60 nations to sign and ratify, and then this treaty will come into force and we'll be able to move forward, primarily in establishing these marine protected areas in areas beyond national jurisdiction, think high seas or the areas that are far from coast, but it's it's well over 70% of the planet. So it's a really big gap that we finally are gonna begin, begin to be able to fill. In our own US context, um, President Biden has announced this um, program called the America the Beautiful Campaign. It's gotten some funding to the IRA and other things. Same idea, we need to protect 30% of land and ocean by 2030. So some of these areas that you're looking at in the, in the dark, purplish color <laughs> around Hawaii, especially are already protected. But if you look around, um, you know, kind of continental US, California is doing okay, um, but the rest of it is not doing very well at all. So there's a lot of work to do. And the other thing about protecting biodiversity is you can't do it in just in one place. You gotta spread it across all the geographies if you really want all the marine life to be protected. And then of course, California has, also through Governor Newsom and the legislature this just past session have approved and adopted 30 by 30. So California has also made this commitment. Um, California is actually doing okay already. We got 15% roughly protected of our state waters. And so we're looking to protect um, the next 15% in the next five years. So we're really active in that conversation as well. And I did wanna just put this picture back in here in California's um, context, because these are those giant black sea bass that were earlier strung up on the pole. Um, there have been some recovery. California's got about 20 year experience with establishing marine protected areas and in the Channel Islands, these fish have come back um, where it's a little bit further away from people and a little more remote, but um, they have the opportunity to um, not be fished and not be killed. And, and they've started to come back in actually pretty significant numbers in some places. So we are seeing some restoration when we've protected some of these important places. So our organization um, first is an advocate for wildlife. We're trying to you know, make sure that policies like you know, Endangered Species Act and, and places to protect these um, 
their the habitats of these species are protected. So that's one of the big um, pieces we work on. Um, I mentioned the Hawaii has been doing really well. This the purple ish area here is an area called Papahanaumo Kuakea. It was actually signed into um, designation by uh, President George Bush with the urging of our organization and many others back in the early 2000, well, 2006. Um, but it's home to monk seals and albatrosses and tunas and turtles. And so we you know, have one of the world's biggest, best protected areas under US um, jurisdiction. And, and we had a lot to do with trying to advocate for that and get that established. We're looking to repeat that, but at the same time, we realize we have to do things like rewilding the ocean. We are missing key things like sea otters, sometimes considered keystone species. So we talked about the kelp forest earlier and, and inspired me for sure. Um, for the most part, and, and maybe you've heard this story before, but you know, sea otters will eat things like sea urchins and, and other things that eat kelp. And so when you have you know, abundant populations of sea otters, they keep the predators down and the kelp flourishes and the kelp is then home for lots and lots and lots of different species. And so we consider sea otters to be a keystone species in the system. Part of the reason we know this about kelp forests is because there are still sea otters in kelp forests. Um, where there aren't sea otters, you get these areas like this off of North Coast of California, where there's lots of urchins, and the urchins then eat down the kelp, and there's a lot less biodiversity. Um, and, and if we had otters, we wouldn't have urchin barrens like that in these systems. And so we know from in the Monterey region, where there still are otters in the kelp forest, that when there's stresses to those kelp forests, um, they come back because they still have this keystone predator in the system and it helps mitigate some of these, you know, things like urchin outbreaks. Um, that you up there? Interesting, as we think a little bit more about kelp as a carbon, um, like a forest holds a lot of carbon, we start to think about otters in this context as being important for maintaining healthy um, kelp forests, healthy sources of carbon, and then, you know, What's the role of an otter in terms of helping with climate change as well? Well, it extends a little bit beyond this. So one of the things, kelp has a bit of carbon, but it's a lot of water. Seagrasses, as you see here, and mangroves and salt marsh habitat, like we have around San Francisco Bay. And remember I said sea otters were in San Francisco Bay, um, are very, very rich carbon sinks. But because the otters were removed out of these estuary systems like San Francisco Bay, probably by the 1830s or 40s, we don't have any real scientific knowledge of what their role was in estuaries. But thanks to the otter recovery in Monterey Bay, and the, if you've seen them come into Elkhorn Slough, and if you haven't, you ought to go down and look because there's hundreds of otters that live in Elkhorn Slough, and you can get right up close to them, and you can kayak right up close to them, and it's a fantastic experience. The healthiest Seagrass beds we know of now in California are in Elkhorn Slough, and it's because otters in estuaries do the same sort of ecosystem engineering they do in kelp forests. We just didn't know about this because we'd extinguished sea otters out of estuaries early on before scientists had a chance to look. So they eat crabs, and crabs, you know, are a really, well, it's, it's a little bit more complicated food system. It's not quite as simple as the sea otter, sea urchin, kelp. But the crabs um, are responsible for and eat amphipods. Amphipods are just these little kind of pill bug kind of looking things, which are normally what are grazing on the, the seagrasses. Well, they don't actually eat the seagrass. They eat all the things that grow on the seagrass. So the seagrass is then healthier. It's clean. Just think about, you know, they just kind of have a little um, grazer that keeps lichens and encrusting things off the seagrass. And so the seagrass, when there's, an otter because they, they eat the crabs and the crabs don't eat these little bugs. The seagrass then have a lot more of these little bugs on them. And as a result, they are much healthier and grow and photosynthesize and, and expand. The other thing that um, crabs do in estuaries is they burrow into, the, into the, the banks and that causes sloughing. And so there's this constant loss of sea, uh, of sea grass and salt marsh habitat. And so by eating those crabs, that doesn't happen near as fast. So this is all science of the last kind of decade or two, but really starts you to think, okay, we need a program 
a rewilding program to bring sea otters back into estuaries because that could be a real trigger to not only you know making these systems healthier, but these are the kinds of systems that capture tons and tons and tons of carbon. So you can see around San Francisco Bay where there's been some modeling, oops, go back, um, of these dark red areas. And so, you know, in the East Bay there, and, and again, talked a little bit about Richardson Bay, areas where really, really good otter habitat if we were to get moving on this project. It's a lot of work to do still, but it, it's kind of, people are really talking about it seriously. And in fact, the Kashaya Pomo, who are on the Sonoma coast, are um, very interested in returning otters into the kelp forests of Northern California as well. Um, so there, there, it's a very active conversation and one that, that's hopeful at this point. A lot of the work we do as scientists is trying to track this idea of 30 by 30. We're gonna protect 30% of the ocean by 2030. How are we doing? Are we doing it well? Are we gonna get and deliver the things that we wanna do with it? So that is a program we call Marine Protection Atlas. It's run by our organization. Um, we also have a secondary layer of that, which is blue parks. So when they're really, really outstanding protected areas that are delivering on biodiversity benefits and, uh, you know, the ecosystem benefits that provide, you know, value to people, they can win a blue park um, award. But this blue park status also has become an international kind of guide star for everyone. So it's like you want your MPA to actually deliver what you need it to deliver you know, line, align it with the, the Blue Park standard. And of course, you know, this is all really important as we are gonna have to accelerate quite a bit to get to the 20 by 30 goal. Um, again, I, I think I explained this a little bit, but a marine protected area in MPA is an area where fishing is excluded, oil and gas is excluded, mining is excluded. And you think all oh, that's great, except that that isn't always how they're designed. <laughs> they sometimes allow for an awful lot of activity so the details matter quite a bit. And, you know, we spend a lot of time in the details. I won't go through all the really ins and outs of the details, but all MPAs, all marine protected areas are not alike. So globally right now, 8.2% of the ocean is protected as governments assess it. So governments self-report their numbers. That's an 8.2% number of the global ocean. We go through that number and look at it a little more carefully and we say, eh, it's probably closer to 2.9%. So those are the two numbers you see on this page. And the rest of this website kind of dives through the research we do to kind of get into this. That's the kind of conversation we bring to the Convention on Biological Diversity. It's like, okay, great to set a target. Let's make sure that target actually is, you know, with areas that are actually gonna achieve effective areas. So again, this point, just a very simple one, not all marine protected areas are the same. Um, we have, of course, a choice in this conversation. So if you kind of think about, again, kind of this is a timeline as well as a, this is what the ocean looked like, what we want the ocean to return to. At present, we're missing an awful lot of marine life from the ocean. So we can protect it strongly, get back to what we consider like a fully protected. We know it will recover. Um, or we can not protect it quite so well. <laughs> and you don't see the same level of recovery. So this is why we're, we're really keen on this. The science is really strong um, and we're trying to you know, be an advocate of the science, be an advocate for the science into the management as well as into the policy um, as we move forward. Um, well, I can kind of um, quickly go through this. This is part of the global assessment of where these marine protected areas are and the different colors indicate different levels of protection in different parts of the world. And again, you can kind of see you know, that the Hawaii in the, in the dark blue here is that one really iconic um, area. So we learned from what we were doing there. And again, this is just kind of assessment of where we are in terms of 30%, maybe a little bit hard to understand, but if that's the 30% circle of what we need to get to the total global ocean, these are the levels that we're at right now. So we've got a lot of, a lot of work to do. Um, looked at another way, the trend line isn't, accelerating up as fast as it needs to be. So we still have a lot of work to do. Luckily, there's a lot of philanthropists that are getting engaged and trying to help support governments, support NGOs, support conservation organizations to, to help bend that curve, but it still requires an awful lot of work. So we work a lot within this community, share this kind of information, share where we're working, try to make sure that the, the community, um, and it, it is a very big, vast community, we're a relatively 
um, small organization within it, but very focused on the science of all this that we share um, through the community. And we also, as I said, track all the commitments. So governments love to get up in front of, you know, their colleagues at big international meetings and, you know, in the UN um, Climate Cop and things like that and say, yes, we're going to protect more. Um, and that's great, but some of them don't get past that point. So we're trying to hold up the mirror a little bit and say, hey, you guys, you made this commitment. Let's move it along. <laughs> Let's keep going. The ocean needs you. So we do need to really try and accelerate. And we think about this a lot because as scientists, it's great to be, oh, we're really smart. This isn't working very well, blah, blah, blah. That doesn't inspire anybody, right? So you have to inspire governments as well as your colleagues, as well as people. And so to get to this kind of game changing level of 30% is going to need a lot of not just, you know, passionate people and inspired people, but just a lot of effort to get there. Um, and so, you know, talking to the state of California and guys like Wade Crowfoot, who is the resource agency director and, and the guys that sit on Fish and Game Commission, they, they all know what's needed, but they need to hear from us and know that there's some people backing the idea that this can happen and that we want to see it happen because it is a real challenge. So this is kind of the model for where our Blue Parks initiative came in. Like, let's celebrate rather than criticize, right? Somebody's doing it right. Let's draw attention to them. Let's make sure people know that this is a really outstanding place. They can support this. And as they get, you know, acknowledged and they get recognized, then more people, we get calls from, you know, folks every once in a while, we want a blue park. And it's like, well, I know you want one. <laughs> what are you going to do to get one? Um, so that's the advantage of being small and a science-based is that we can actually, um, we can't be co-opted very easily by the conversation because, you know, we know who we are and, and we're not, you know, out there and, and susceptible to kind of being intimidated from it. So we have kind of two things we're doing now. We give out these awards for Blue Parks, but then we use what we call Blue Sparks as an opportunity to work with those people who want their area to become a Blue Park and figure out how we go about that. So this is the map of the 27 Blue Parks. It covers an area of ocean that's about 2.8 million square kilometers. I know that doesn't really mean anything. It's about, a, it's a little bit bigger than Mediterranean Sea in terms of the coverage area. So it's actually quite a big part of the ocean, but it's still down in this two to 3%, not the 30%. Um, we give out these awards, as I said, to um, different, in different venues around um, the world. This one was up in Vancouver at a big national conference and we, um, I don't know if you can see the, the quote in the middle. One of the awards went to a, a marine protected area in Panama, and we actually had the governor, the president of the uh, Panama tweeting out the, his pleasure at having seen his country acknowledged in such a way. Um, and this, um, oops, sorry. this woman is actually the representative from Pitcairn Island, um, which for those of you who don't know about Pitcairn, it's where um, uh, Captain Bly's crew ended up that mutinied and uh, started its own like you know British colony there's still about 40 or 50 uh, folks living there today but they have uh, with the support of the UK government um, established one of the world's biggest areas similar to our uh, area off Hawaii. So we're trying to use this global frame and all this work I was telling you about to kind of inspire and help support these local parks and the rangers that work there. Um, this is another uh, marine protected area manager, Angelique Sanko in uh, Tupataha Reefs in the Philippines. Um, we worked with her and her team. They have a really beautiful remote area, um, do a lot of great work, are, are a really um, wonderful place. But they, we nominated them, worked with them, and their rangers got a special award this past year for really being, you know, a great example of what community-based patrol. These guys used to be fishermen. Um, they transferred over to being rangers and work fishing community to ensure that this area actually does protect uh, the marine life in this area. And we, and we had another example of a different protected area in Brazil that we were working with that also got the same ranger award. So we're really happy that, you know, not just us, but other conservation uh, organizations are really thinking about this question as we move forward. Um, as I said, Blue Sparks is a little bit different. This is kind of a community-led um, effort rather than kind of a top-down effort. So they need to kind of, you know, work 
come to us. We don't really go to them. And then we kind of work with them to establish what we can do to help support them in this idea that they're you know, doing good protection, doing good monitoring, good, doing good enforcement, working with the community, educating the community, all these pieces that make uh, their parks work really well. Um, and this past year, we were able to give small grants out to uh, some of these places to help them with specific needs about, you know, um, different things. So Missoula is in Indonesia, Pedro del Viento is a part off the coast of Chile, Apo Reef's another area in the Philippines. Um, so we're starting to grow this um, network and try to keep, you know, inspiring people. So this, uh, when I talked a few years ago, we were just starting to think about this idea. Um, and I'm really happy that it's grown as well as it has and really um, been able to uh, support some of these parks. And, and it looks like an area we're going to be able to continue to grow into in the coming year, hopefully to kind of keep going for that 30% um, idea. We just announced another new one last week, um, which was Shark Fin Bay, which is another Philippines are really on board and they're really working hard. Um, and we're gonna actually uh, um, announce this coming week um, with uh, some folks that we work with in Palau, another area. So this is, you know, their effort, their initiative, they're really driving it. We're trying to cheerlead, support them, be kind of a foundation of science for them to draw on, but really try and make sure that as they move through this, they really get the desired outcomes they want from the protected areas. And we get to see the ocean improve and the biodiversity improve. One of our um, really fun opportunities recently, and, and I'm looking really forward, I hope I'm uh, able to go there. So we found a sponsor in a company called Saloon Lines. They're a company that's a shipping company that works mostly in Africa and the Middle East. They wanted to support some local communities. We had this blue spark off the coast of Mozambique, um, which is in Humbang um, Bay Community Network. Uh, they decided they would help, and we were able to buy a boat for these guys um, in Mozambique so they could actually, you know, do the outreach and get out on the water and work with the, you know, the fishermen who didn't necessarily know about their work in the community and try to make sure they could educate them. So it's um, it, it's an opportunity. We're, we're hopefully all going to be there sometime in the coming 2024, and, and Blue Quest is a partner of ours who does films, and so we're going to try and make a film about this community as well, help them move forward. As you might know, Mozambique, one of the most poorest countries on the world. So, you know, it's really kind of um, kind of amazing to think of a, a group that's headquartered here in Glen Ellen, uh, able to kind of pull strings and build relationships all the way around the world. But there's a real desire for groups to kind of uh, do this kind of work. And uh, they, they really need kind of help wherever we can bring it. Um, we're still very active in the U.S. in California. You may have heard about the Chumash National Marine Sanctuary, which is off the kind of Santa Barbara coast. It's been um, put forward as a National Marine Sanctuary, and so the, the tribe has been working to move that forward. It's actively being um, reviewed right now um, by the federal government in public comment period is open. Um, I mentioned working in the Florida Keys. They also uh, had a lot of climate challenges, but we're working with them to improve their management. And then we're also been working um, within the remote territories of the West, called the remote Pacific remote islands, which are the lower half of this image, um, trying to add additional protections and, and additional management measures there. Um, I mentioned the high seas. So the treaty is kind of winding its way into force. Um, but we've also been trying to start the groundwork of laying some of these um, first marine protected areas on the high seas. So uh, the one I'm most involved in is an extension of the Hawaii one, which is an area called Emperor Seamounts, named after some Japanese um, emperors. This is this little dot here. Um, but there's a lot of potential in the high seas. And so through the uh, alliance, we've been trying to build coalitions of groups throughout the world to help support and, and move these places along. All right, I'm almost to the end. We'll take some questions. Um, this has kind of become our motto, especially during kind of COVID in the remote um, times is we, we don't do a lot of traveling to these places, but we really very much appreciate the efforts that are ongoing. I had a, an intern from Papua New Guinea with us last year um, trying to you know learn what she could from us and also us trying to figure out how we could support her. But, but the Amanda Gorman code uh, quote here uh, really kind of resonates with our organization of something we're trying to do more of as we go forward. Um, said we weren't big. We got a staff of, uh, well, it's, it's 10 at the moment, and we're going to hire a new person here soon. 
um, and our board of directors. Um, I mentioned this kind of 25 year track um, record of doing science and advocacy and biodiversity protection. So we spend a lot of time at conferences and big meetings trying to you know, inform people and kind of meet one-on-one, -on -one, build our partnerships and so forth. Um, so I'm optimistic. I think there's a lot of um, people who are trying to paddle in the same direction. Um, it's not easy. Um, as you might guess, all of the different organizations you work with have their own programs, have their own funding needs, have their own desires and goals. Um, but this drive towards 30 by 30 is really helping to unite a lot of our um, conservation colleagues and academic partners as well. And, we, and I can say this, so all of these groups we interact with all the time. Um, I know the ocean seems a little esoteric, a little bit out there. So I kind of made a, a list of a few things that um, can happen in, you know, not just about supporting us, but kind of lightening your footprint on the planet and helping, you know, make room for the other life. I think you probably heard this from before, but if you kind of add up all the human and all the things that we grow directly for food, it outweighs all the rest of the um, life on earth, except for fishes. So fishes still have an opportunity to come back. Um, uh, but it is hopeful that the ocean is still an opportunity to see lots and lots of restoration, but we really have to kind of you know, consciously address and make room um, for these others. And I know that they, I only talked about the things that I'm kind of working on. I didn't talk to you a lot about plastics, but you know, the oil and gas industry, um, I, we, we got to find a way to kind of lower them because now, even if we're not using fossil fuels, we're still using plastics and that's still enabling them to make a lot of money um, by um, drilling for oil and gas and, and um, refining it. All right, so that's it. Um, I do like to use this slide because the biggest threat to, I think, anything is expecting somebody else to solve the problem and not um, taking the chance to extend your own um, efforts in that direction. So I appreciate your uh, invitation here and all your attention. Thank you very much for the opportunity and I guess we'll do questions. Great, thanks Lance. Uh, thanks so much for your presentation. I'm sure we have some questions. We'll yes. be going back and forth on the mics and please again, hold it up to your mouth and we'll start right here at the front. Uh, a couple of questions. One, can you talk more about the sea stars if we know what caused the problem to begin with? How are they doing now? And two, in a properly protected and chosen uh, blue park, what's the approximate timeline for it to recover and for its sea life to start spilling out into the rest of the area for people to then go ahead and take? Great questions. Um, really good. So we think that blob um, was responsible for elevated warm temperatures in which it allowed a virus to move into and you know maybe the, the thought is and, and they're not entirely clear still that what normally would be a cold winter would kind of knock the virus back but we didn't have that and so it just kept growing and expanding and, and got its own kind of version of a, a sea star pandemic going. Um, there are um, efforts underway to kind of regrow and kind of, you know, think of through this and some of the scientists at Friday Harbor up in the University of Washington have been working a little bit more on that disease. But I think um, at best, we're seeing only the smallest bit of sea star recovery. Um, so one of the things about, and to your second question, recovery in a park, part depends on what the history of that park has been. So if it's an area that's relatively um, pristine, you might not see a lot of immediate um, response because it's it's more or less functionally intact. If it's an area that, and so ironically, the areas that are most heavily fished are the ones that can recover the quickest. And, and so maybe a few years to, you know, five to 10, and that's kind of where 10 years into the, the California state, um, what they call their decadal management review, but they saw really good um, recovery. So often the areas that it's hardest to protect are the ones where the fishing has been at the heaviest, but it's also the areas where you're likely to see the best response. So we're, we're trying to, you know, use that uh, to work in, but, it, but it's, it's definitely a five to 10 year process. And that's why when you think only six years to the, the target, right? Well, you still got 
a decade more to kind of see the kinds of, you know, even beginnings of the recovery we want to see. Yes, doctor, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Several years ago, the EPA was instrumental in removing the oysters in uh, Drake's Bay, the Estero. Mm -hmm. uh, has the effect of that been effective? Is, is the water clearer, fresher than it was before? Or maybe you don't um, know. It, so it's a very, um, there's some very interesting um, books about this, including the Oyster Wars, if you want to kind of read through a pretty good history of what went on there. Um, oysters are not at least in modern times, native to California. So everything that we think of as an oyster farm is, is something that's been brought here and farmed. And so the idea with the Drake's Estero, which became the kind of this flashpoint for the West Marin community, was that the lease was up on the, on the oyster farm and the park and, and some of the scientists wanted to have it removed so it could go back to being um, essentially a, a native ecosystem. Um, at the same time, it's, you know, dairy ranches everywhere out there, right? So all kinds of pollution. Um, so the oysters were artificial, but doing some work. The oyster farm was, um, oysters do some work to clear the water. Um, the oyster farm had a lot of different challenges, like, you know, nets and plastic and breakaway bits and pieces. And then there was also this issue about where they're disrupting kind of the harbor seals and the different animals that lived in the area. So um, I think in general that the, it's also a prime location for sea otter um, <laughs> reintroduction now um, because of all the eelgrasses there. And I don't know if the park will move forward with that or not, but it's, it's one of the areas that's being talked about. So I think in general, it's um, looking good. They cleaned it up. They did a great job of cleaning it up and giving you a very good complicated long answer. <laughs> but, um, and the harbor seals are doing very well there. Um, and I think they're still monitoring kind of the, the sea grasses and so forth to get a better understanding of the at the actual ecosystem as, it, as it's moving forward. Thank you for your talk today. It's very, very helpful. Um, with the Chinese doing so much fish factory farming, is fish farms viable way or economically to start feeding the world's population that, that relies on fish? Right. Um, so the first thing I would say is all fish are not the same. Um, so there's very intensive aquaculture for things like salmon, um, which require, um, you know, big pens, a lot of food, the food conversion of what you have to catch in the wild to feed a salmon isn't very good, but we all like salmon. So salmon farms make quite a bit of money. Um, Chinese historically had the, you know, the four fishes, the four integrated aquaculture of different types of carp, which worked phenomenally well. And, you know, an 800 year old, um, way of, of feeding their population. In fact, it's a little bit of a ecological uh, dilemma because all those four carp are now in the Midwest of the US in the, in the Louisiana River and up into the Great Lakes and it, it's its own little ecological disaster. It's very, pretty fascinating um, about these carp. So, but they're in their environment, much better balanced and, and have fed the Chinese population for years. Um, we are losing a lot of habitat in coastal areas for things like developing uh, mangroves into shrimp farms. So that's not a, a really great uh, trade-off because mangroves are very important habitats for fishes as well as for uh, sequestering uh, carbon as well as protecting coastlines. So I wish I'd give you a yes um, in general, um, having just talked about oysters. Oyster farms are a really good way to um, get a kind of environmental benefit and also have a kind of a farming that, that's pretty low intensive. Um, so shellfish is typically good. Um, fish, it's a little bit more variable. And, you know, there's some new offshore ideas about, you know, putting pins into the high ocean and so forth. Um, but I think each one is a little bit of a different case. So it's hard to give you a, a one, one answer. I'll let Um, I'm, I was wondering about this 30% and how uh, realistic this is. Uh, my observation, well, I thought I knew, <laughs> I don't know what I really know, but uh, is that parts of the ocean are extremely productive and other parts are virtual deserts mm -hmm. compared to that. Um, and 
that's the case, it's 30% could be way more than we need to protect, or 30% could be way, way short of what we need to protect, especially if who's, who's picking the areas. Sure. Yeah, and so, and then there's, although which also makes me wonder about pelagic fish um, and where the 30% right. comes in with that. Yeah, um, so I'll kind of repeat some of those questions. Re really, really good points. Um, the idea of where does 30% come from and how does that actually work? And is it enough or not enough? Um, and how does it relate to different types of animals, some that move a lot and some that might not move very much? Um, so I think the research that's kind of accumulated over the last couple of decades finds that 30% is kind of in the middle mark. And so it's become kind of a convenient rallying cry. It may not be enough in some places and it may not you know, do much for pelagic species. But as I alluded to, we're not really talking about just one big spot. We're talking about a portfolio approach in which you capture different types of ecosystems all throughout the ocean. And so it doesn't really help us to just say, oh, we're gonna just close the North Pacific because that doesn't do anything for Antarctica or the polar systems or, or anything else. So it really is a matter of, of spreading this around. I think right now it's, it's um, important as kind of setting what is a necessary um, kind of mindset about moving forward in terms of what we need to protect. Um, but, it, but it's gonna be a challenge to get there. Um, and certainly when you think of where we are and where we need to get to it, we may not get there, but it also depends on if it's just 30% and everything else is exactly like a, a free fire zone, right? Then the 30% won't be near enough, right? But if 30% is part of 100% of the ocean that's well managed, then it might be exactly those places. And, and so one of the things that you achieve in a protected area is that all the animals that live in there you know, like those giant black sea bass that don't move, grow up to full body size, right? They get to be old and as fish age, they grow and they continue to grow. They don't stop growing, they're indiscriminate growers. So they kind of grow throughout the body. And the older ones would normally get fished out of a population, suddenly become these reproductive gold mines of individuals. So, you know, so we do need to kind of think about, you know, your point exactly, where do you balance this? Um, but there's a lot to it for sure. This is a two-part question. Okay. Um, I'll wait a minute. Um, my husband, the last 10 years before he retired, was he was he was chief of um, he was he headed up the scientific division for California's oil spill prevention and response. Mm -hmm. So, I, two parts here. First question is um, how is that doing? How effective is fish and games oil spill or resources, oil spill prevention um, and response? How are they doing? Are they effective still? I, he was tenacious when he was heading it, but uh, how's how's it going? Um, so I, I mean, I worked at the Marine Mammal Center for a while early in my career, and so I did get involved in oil spill response for for at least for marine mammals. Um, and so it was great that that center, was he down in Santa Cruz with the center or is he up in? Don, was, Don was stationed in um, Sacramento. Sacramento, The resources yeah. building. So, so they do have this um, nice facility down in Santa Cruz where they're able to bring in animals during an oil spill. I guess the good news is we haven't seen any really bad oil spill. Yes. There, there was a little bit of a, a, a pipeline break down in Santa Barbara a few years back that, that had an impact. Um, so that's the good news. I believe the program's still very much up and running. I'm not- good totally engaged with the details of it. But yeah, they're they're equipped to to do um, birds and otters in relatively relatively rapid response. He did a lot of work. His yeah. team did a lot of work um, uh, uh, with the Channel Island. Some something happened in the Ch Channel Islands right. and the recovery. Yeah, he was involved with that too. Yep, and I yep. heard that is doing very well now in the Channel Islands. Yeah, I think um, the acute phase of that is always really challenging because the animals can't necessarily survive being oiled very heavily. Longer term, you know, there, there's oil in the system and it can mm -hmm. break up um, and be adjusted, uh, be adapted to to a certain regard. But 
you know, it, it's kind of a death by a thousand cuts where every little thing kind of keeps having an impact. But but the state does have a nice program and I'm glad to hear he was last passionate question. about it. <laughs> last question. Uh, he was also a, a diver for abalone. Mm -hmm. How is the abalone uh, population doing? Because um, I know it was threatened a couple of years ago. Well, I don't know. Yeah, it it's it's not really recovered from the, the heat wave. It's still there, but on now... Um, I, I think it'll still be years before the North Coast really has enough abalone back to, um, but while well, they're working on doing some work around the urchins to try and restore the kelp, and if the kelp is healthier, then that'll be good for the abalone as well. Yeah. I have two questions. Mm -hmm. uh, one is sort of an observation, because maybe you can't say much about it, but, oh, okay. <laughs> okay. I noticed in your maps that there was nothing in South Asia, nothing off the coast of India or Sri Lanka. Have you just not been able to do that because you're a fairly small organization or has there been resistance? That's one question. Um, in, India is quite a challenging place. Um, uh, we actually have some partners and have tried to engage the, the idea of setting up some blue sparks, but they don't, um, I'm aware of one area, the Mahatma Gandhi National Park, that has a coastal area that we've talked to, but I think it's different countries just kind of fall into this in different ways. And, and India so far has um, not been one that's kind of taken a leadership role into the ocean space. Yeah. The other question I had is, is more complex, but um, it seems to me that there's a, a strong link. You're talking with some about blue sparks in some very poor countries mm -hmm. and even countries like India and you know Indonesia tourism is very important for them uh, as an economic right. uh, driver and beautiful oceans and nice beaches are part of the tourism thing mm -hmm. have you been able to use that much to get private sector involvement or uh, what's your strategy to bring the, the tourism and ocean uh, thing together right Right. Well, being, um, first of all, cognizant of the problem of loving things to death, um, we definitely work with tourism and some private companies. So actually in Indonesia, as well as in um, Tanzania, we have blue parks that are a result of private um, groups that are doing kind of eco resorts and working with the communities in different ways. So, so it is a um, Indonesia and the Philippines are very far out in front because of their interest in kind of promoting their tourism and doing well. And they, both of those countries have done a lot of work and continue to do a lot of work. They also have very poor populations that are kind of in the mix of it. So um, we're, every country is a little bit different, but at least in, in some cases we do try and especially engage with ecotourism. And a couple of our partners are, are more in front of that than us. Hi, over <laughs> here. Um, I had read about the cargo ships changing the oil that they're using that cross world global cargo ships that used to use, I guess, the dirtiest oil mm -hmm. that was causing the acid rain, but that there was a benefit in that because it was creating this cloud that was shading the ocean and that part of what's making this heat up. I had also uh, read about some research Australia was doing with shooting seawater to create clouds do you is your organization involved in any of that to protect the ocean and the heating and do you know not not frontline work in terms of those things and i know there's those and, and many other um strategies in terms especially in terms of this reflectivity question there was a group for a while who was trying to engineer a uh, little bit beads of glass to put them onto ice do the same thing, kind of protect the ice from melting by reflecting um, light. And I, I think we're um, very much in need of interactive strategies. You know, geoengineering is very contentious in terms of like, what didn't we think of? And this becomes a terrible idea. But I do think we're at the point where we have to do much more. Um, and I, I was part of a team that actually kind of was trying to set up a standard or what do you need to do in your ge geoengineering approach to kind of know, inform people about what you're doing and then kind of step forward in ways that hopefully avoid doing it 
backwards. But in the case of those specifically, I don't have a lot of knowledge of that. Yeah. I, I can hear you if you want me to repeat it. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so the question was about the plastic gyres and microplastics and um, how bad it will be. <laughs> uh, so what we have learned um, recently is that trying to collect the plastic out of the ocean is, is not our best strategy. Um, I, I mentioned a little bit about, you know, the, the, the oil and gas companies, because the plastics come out of oil and gas mining really kind of continuing to make money and a lot of money at producing plastic, especially single use plastics. So, so there's some need to recognize that, that that's a big part of the driver is just the, just the mass amount of money made, being made on producing plastics. What does seem to work a little bit better in the plastic cleanup world is positioning um, traps in estuaries and rivers so that what's generated on land is actually caught before it gets into the ocean. Um, the, the ocean cleanup, which was one of the big high profile efforts to go out and pick up plastic has kind of a, abandoned that strategy. Just the, the engineering of it was just way too complicated. And if you're picking up plastic, you're picking up all the little animals that live within the plastic. And so that isn't necessarily a great strategy. Microplastics is, is not something I'm optimistic about. Um, we really have to make a big effort to um, but I don't know that anybody so far has a, a solution. I'm kind of hopeful for bacteria and fungus and something. We'll figure out a way to eat it. But yeah. I'm sorry, I don't have better news there. Um, Oakmont is part of Sonoma County, which has a, a, a very large ocean and, and some bay. And I think it would be very interesting if you could give us some, uh, you know, some something back to Sonoma County. Yeah. Uh, so Sonoma does have um, some interesting opportunities. Um, I mentioned um, the Cachao Pomo, but but they're really building on, so the state created a, a network of marine protected areas uh, up and down the coast. And I was part of the team that designed this for the Sonoma Mendocino Marin coastline. So uh, Stewart's Point and a little bit further south um, around Bodega Marine Reserve and a few other places, there are these protected areas and they are being monitored and they are doing pretty well. Um, the, I mentioned the tribe because they're very interested in potentially restoring Otters. The good news about otters, everybody's so worried that, oh, if you let go otters, they'll go up and down the coast and they'll destroy everything. All the work with reintroducing otters is they don't move. They really like the place. They either leave and go all the way 5,000 miles back, or not quite that far, but you know, back to where they started from, or they just stay there and they move very, very slowly. The populations don't grow very quickly. So it's very important to the Kashaya, who are part of being um, uh, the Port Ross and being kind of enslaved there that they kind of get back to the importance of, of otters in their ecosystem. Um, and, you know, the, the, the coast of Sonoma has, you know, got a lot of parks and, and really beautiful. I mentioned also that, you know, Sonoma Creek going the other direction um, has the National Wildlife Refuge and a lot of rich wetlands and the Sonoma Land Trust and many groups are working to um, restore the flow to the bay there and take back some of that farmland and turn it back into this, um, uh, ecosystem in which your salt marsh habitat and get the tidal flow back in it and helps with carbon, helps with flood control. 
What we do about Highway 37, I don't really know, but um, that's going to be a big problem for us. <laughs> Doctor, I believe we have time for one more okay. question. I understand that and the gentleman the use of right high here. frequency ultrasound by the military uh, in, can interfere with uh, whale migration. Is that a problem? Um, it, it is a problem. Um, they can have very, so the question is like, you know, the, the, the military um, can produce pretty outrageous amounts of sound in certain applications. And, you know, it's part of submarine warfare and lots of other things. Um, the test range off of Southern California is still an area in which they are now trying harder to layers and layers of, you know, well, did we look for all the whales? Did we get all the boats away before we test this thing? But but I do think that that the issue of sound in the ocean environment, not just the military application, but in general, is something we're learning much more about. It does disrupt, especially uh, whale migrations in terms of disorienting whales in certain situations. It's known if you get a whale right in the, the, the kind of the cone of the, this really extreme military sound, it can, it can kill them. Um, I think maybe some of that has kind of been um, the military's said, okay, we're not going to do that anymore. Um, but all bets are off if you end up in an actual war, right? And <laughs> they decide they're going to, you know, use the different um, types types of, you know, operations to use some of these things. Um, but yeah, I think we're, you know, we we could probably make another arm's length laundry list of things that are affecting our ocean and, and noise is going to be one of them as well. I believe we have time for one more, one more question. Thanks. Just a quick response from you about your opinion of offshore wind farms impact on the ocean, good, bad, or indifferent. I'm pro um, personally for the wind farms because I do think the climate change is significant enough that we need to move to alternatives quickly. I do think having said that, we need to make sure we're, we're citing them in ways that, you know, is putting them in places where, you know, they're not going to be as disruptive to migrations. There's obviously pretty restrictive circumstances in which wind farms can actually operate successfully. And then you need, you know, to somehow bring that power on shore. So you've got to get, get underwater cables and so forth to bring power along. So there's a lot of things to consider in it. Um, but the experience, um, I think, of Europe, especially in the North Sea, is that they can mitigate most of that pretty effectively. Um, and, you know, to my point of just getting through, like, all the, the activity around removing marine life, these actually would become their own little reserves in which marine life would be protected because they wouldn't allow a lot of boats and a lot of activity and a lot of farming. So we're industrializing the ocean. We need to address climate change. We have some... Yeah, we don't have any perfect solutions, but, but I would say that's one we need to work on for sure. Lance, we want to thank you so much for coming back to the symposium and joining thank us you. live. We appreciate your question and answer. Thank you so much. We hope all of you will join us again to, um, next sure. week for Clark Lystra at the White House Situation Room on 9-11. And we hope you have a wonderful week. Thank you.